Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Greetings to you, esteemed ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the program Views and the Continent. Today we want to dive into another pressing issue, and of course uh, that has the uh, effect or that is affecting uh, the socio-economic development of uh, developing nations uh, around uh, the world, especially as far as the African continent is concerned. Uh, this issue is, of course, uh, the debt distress or debt uh, crisis uh, specifically. We are going to focus uh, on uh, the uh, challenges faced by uh, the African nations as they thrive or strive to find a delicate equilibrium between responsibility and uh, global cooperation in seeking viable solutions. President Paul Kagame of Rwanda addressing uh, during his address uh, to the uh, recent uh, UN uh, General Assembly underlined that developing countries are constrained by debt crisis, including higher cost of borrowing, which according to him causes economic disparities and uh, slows down collective efforts towards attaining sustainable development goals. It should be noted that in recent years, Africa has been struggling with a mounting debt burden hampering its progress towards sustainable development. According to the African Development Bank Group, uh, by the end of 2020, Africa's total external debt stood at a shocking $583 billion, representing a 35% increase since the year 2010. This accounts for approximately one third of the continent's total GDP. Such extensive debt levels demand urgent attention and highlight the critical need for a concerted global response. However, to further comprehend the gravity of this crisis, it is crucial to examine the trends within Africa's debt landscape. The World Bank highlights that recent years have witnessed an increase in debt distress among several African countries. As of 2020, 18 of uh, 54 African nations were classified as being in debt distress or at risk of slipping into it. Third, there is the urgent need for collective or collaborative action to address Africa's debt crisis. Resolving this crisis requires not only responsible borrowing practices from African nations, but also robust global cooperation in the form of responsible lending, debt relief mechanisms, and sustainable economic development initiatives. And of course, uh, that is what we are going to discuss in today's edition of the program Views on the Continent, an informative and as well uh, uh, interactive uh, program, of course, uh, capitalizing on an aspect which uh, the Rwandan leadership underlined while delivering his address at the just concluded United Nations General Assembly, which focused on how uh, debt uh, stress or debt crisis is hampering or slowing down the economic trajectory of uh, many uh, developing countries, especially in Africa. Uh, you are most uh, welcome. If you are just joining, this is Views on the Continent. Just to underline uh, that, uh, uh, among other things, uh, the discussions on today will focus on areas like uh, uh, the impact of debt crisis on uh, development nations. Also, we'll look at the, the responsibility of uh, debt and creditor nations uh, and of course the role of global cooperation in uh, bringing resolve to the debt distress and uh, finally also focusing on uh, the uh, balancing economic growth and uh, debt uh, uh, sustainability you are most welcome uh, together we are going to discuss uh, this uh, and it is on this note that i will introduce to you the panel of experts this day who will bring more analysis on uh, this uh, very important topic and uh, with pleasure i'll be introducing to you professor uh, mark anthony who is joining today in his capacity as a political analyst and also a pan-africanist it's always a pleasure having you join us uh, on the Pan-African television, and we are on the platform Views on the Continent. Welcome, Professor Mark Anthony. Thank you very much, uh, Clarice, for the opportunity. Thank you for permitting me uh, 
discuss over this uh, media concerning issues that are affecting the continent. I want to take this opportunity to greet my family back at home, to extend greetings to my uncle and Garwa Bolai, and to those of you in Bamenda and Boya, it is a pleasure to be here. And I want to greet all Africans listening to me this afternoon because it is very important that we get to extend a salute to you and tell each one of us we have to keep on fighting till we are liberated. Absolutely, it is uh, necessary as uh, a time of uh, total global transformation. African countries cannot be left out. Let's go now to Nigeria. We are meeting uh, Tenil Tayer, who is joining us on uh, trade and investment uh, expert. It's a pleasure having you once more on the Pan-African television, dear Tayer, and welcome. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here always. Looking forward to having a constructive and thought-provoking uh, uh, debate session uh, with you, uh, uh, gentlemen and uh, lady, just to invite our televiewers uh, that they can follow us live as well on Facebook at Afric Media TV. You can leave your comment uh, regarding our topic for discussion this day. Thank you once uh, more. Uh, noting uh, that uh, uh, since the advent of the COVID-19 and from the time that the World Health Organization uh, announced that it is no longer a uh, health crisis or an emergency. Now countries have been struggling uh, to bring back uh, their economies on track, but then th this aspect of uh, uh, that uh, uh, distress or debt crisis affecting the African continent uh, is a call for concern, and of course uh, why we're here to address uh, this. Before we go into tour, into analyzing, I will invite uh, with the consent uh, of the producer, uh, let's listen uh, to the the uh, uh, part of the excerpt uh, presented by President Paul Kagame in his latest uh, recent address to the United Nations Security Council, and I will join you right after that. Developing countries are constrained by a debt crisis, including higher costs of borrowing. This is causing economic disparities to widen and slowing down our collective progress towards the sustainable development goals. The primary cause of this crisis is high interest rates in developed economies in order to correct for years of quantitative easing. At the same time, Developing countries face exaggerated risk premiums for both currency and political risk, which are simply unjustified. We need serious cooperation to address this. In developing countries, we also have a responsibility to be accountable for the quality of our financial governance and the management of our natural resources. Increasing access to finance also requires reform of our global financial institutions. In this regard, we welcome the proposals of the Bridgetown Initiative, as well as the Paris Summit for a New Global Financing Pact. Rwanda also supports the second replenishment of the Green Climate Fund to create the fiscal space for vulnerable nations to tackle climate change. Africa and small island developing states, many of which are represented in the Commonwealth, want to work with the partners and be part of the solution. That is an important outcome of the recent African Climate Summit held in Nairobi under the leadership of President William Ruto. However, we must not only cool down on climate, we must also cool down on conflict. Today, 
there is no sign of ongoing conflicts ending anytime soon. We do not even see hope from those with the most influence that an end is in sight. Innocent lives are left alone to carry the burden of this instability. Thank you so much, and of course, uh, that is an excerpt of uh, President Paul Kagame's speech, and we're focusing on a debt uh, crisis. We dive straight away uh, to the debate uh, proper. Uh, I would uh, like to start with you, Chenil uh, Tayo. Uh, Today, we are looking at uh, resolving a uh, debt crisis in developing countries and seeing how uh, this can be balanced, or we can have uh, balanced uh, responsibility and gro uh, global cooperation. Uh, uh, before uh, tackling our core questions regarding this, let's understand uh, what a debt crisis is all about and how a country can actually, what can happen before a country is considered to be in debt uh, uh, distress, uh, taking uh, the uh, developing countries, especially in Africa as a case study. Thank you so much. Um, I hope my connection holds. So, I mean, like you've alluded to, debt is neither good nor bad. So many countries in the world um, run on debt. Uh, the US, as one example, being the largest economy in the world, is also one of the most indebted. But then a country is said to be entering debt distress or debt crisis when they are no longer able to service their debt. So it's not bad to take the loans or to take the debt on, um, even as the country has a sovereign state. But then the important thing that you need to do for your partners, for your lenders, is that you need to be able to service the debt because debt usually comes with some particular terms. Um, and when they hit maturity, and even before they hit maturity, um, there's some interest rates that you have to pay. So I can use Nigeria as an example. Um, we were taking on uh, debt and interestingly, a lot of our debt was domestic, but when it comes to the foreign debt, um, there was a question of did we have enough revenue to be able to service our debt because when you cannot service your debt then it means that you cannot access more debt or that uh, more debt becomes just more difficult for you to get and then you get stuck developmentally and then you can now have other um, wider macroeconomic implications for your economy so yes it does distress again is when countries have gotten into a debt position that they cannot sustain um, which can now prevent them from accessing more debt that is often needed for, for carrying out development projects. Uh, listening to you, please, uh, can you actually uh, elucidate more on this uh, question? Like, how can uh, developing nations uh, 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 strike a balance between borrowing for economic growth and also avoiding unsustainable debt levels? Yeah, and it's a very key question because you know, when you borrow money or when you when you when you take on debt, the question is, what do you spend it on? Because when you take on debt today, the idea is that you're going to spend the debt on things that will make sure that tomorrow um, you're able to repay the debt or you're able to service the debt. So you're supposed to carry out some particular kinds of investments that will increase your or improve your revenue position as a country. But I think as African countries, we've struggled to find that exact mix of projects because we do a lot of social investment projects, so which is more welfare. Welfare is very important. It's very good. But if you don't have the right balance between welfare and between economic investment, then you can just be borrowing to spend, so borrowing for consumption, but instead of borrowing for production or borrowing to make sure that tomorrow you're not going back to your debtors, you know, to ask for even more debt. So that's the, the key to sustainability. You borrow today, but then make sure that you have a good mix of projects. So projects that are growing the economy, because when you, when you talk about revenues of government, where is it coming from? It's coming from um, taxation. So taxation on economic activities, whether it's from businesses or personal income, or whether it's even from trade. Um, so you're, you're borrowing to invest in those activities to make sure that they expand to an extent that in the future, in the mid to long term, um, they can now even begin to sustain your own spending um, as a government, or at least sustain your, your general profile, whether it's your debt profile um, or your revenue profile. So that's the key there that we have been struggling to, to figure out, really. Thank you so much, uh, Tenela. I'll come back to you subsequently. Uh, we're going to continue with uh, you, Professor Mark Anthony, and uh, you're quite uh, uh, 
attest uh, that uh, this, of course, uh, is a thought-provoking uh, uh, program, uh, like uh, we heard uh, the Rwandan leadership underlined. Uh, and at one particular moment, he said uh, that it's true that uh, the world is recovering gradually uh, from the effect of uh, the COVID-19, but then there is still a huge disparity uh, when it comes to developing nations and developed nations. So now, but today we are looking at this very uh, important aspect, the, uh, uh, the debt distress of African countries. Can we have your own holistic uh, approach of uh, what uh, the uh, uh, debt distress is for developing nations, especially in uh, the 21st century as far as uh, the uh, uh, African uh, countries are concerned? Uh, I'll begin by actually uh, elucidating that uh, the fact that my beloved sister there just mentioned that debt in itself is not neither bad nor good uh, actually makes uh, a point. She, she made a, a serious point there. The funny thing about debt is that debt on its own actually does not uh, create any negative uh, impact in, a, in an economy as well as creates no positive impact in an economy except the actors who are actually borrowing uh, get to uh, become either effective in implementing the projects that they have they went collecting the debt for or misuse the money that had been borrowed. Uh, when it gets to a point where, as a nation, you are unable to service your loans, then it becomes terrible. You, if you went for a debt, then you are unable to service it. There's a problem. We want to look at this issue from two uh, directions. I want to look at it from two directions. First, I want to say that uh, the bodies that actually give these loans have a serious problem when it comes to Africa. Like you heard Kagame mentioning, the rate at which African nations take loans is different from what uh, Europeans, uh, in fact, the different Europeans and the Western nations actually, uh, uh, the interest rate might differs a lot. Uh, when African nations go to take loans, especially from uh, these uh, private creditors, because most of those who actually place a yoke on the neck of Africa are these Western private creditors. They, when they go taking loans from them, they give loans at a very high interest rate. For example, China, which people complain that is the highest uh, uh, creditor to Africa, the highest that gives loans to Africa, actually is not. The West is. And when we look at the rate at which they give, I just mentioned the, 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 those private creditors. The Western private creditors, they give loans two times higher and, and, and the interest and the interest two times higher, which is problematic in itself. And if you look at your question, you're talking of balancing responsibility. Absolutely. If you see, that is the reason why today there is a discussion on the table which is looking for ways to tell China to follow the rules that were set by the IMF, that were set by the World Bank. And you, if I may remind you, the World Bank and IMF are post-war financial uh, institutions which were actually established for the purpose of restructuring the West, rebalancing the economic situation of the West, not that of the world. And it was manned and actually done by the U.S. And that is why even to today, from the creation of this IMF and the World Bank, the World Bank is 
has had at his head Westerners, particularly from the United States. The IMF has had, have been having uh, 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 leaders at his head, individuals from Europe, from among the G7 uh, countries. So if you look at it, you realize that it is majorly a Western issue. And they are the ones who determine the rules. They are the ones who run the affairs. So you cannot ask the world to believe that these banks were created, these financial institutions were created to help the world, was created to actually build Europe. And that is why they would do everything possible to pull the blanket on them. And look at it. China came as a, a should, I, should I say, a distorter. It came to distort a lot of things. And so when they started doing these, the eyes of Westerners actually getting up. And they are, wow, these guys have come and they are doing, they are destabilizing everything. And now they are tending to ask China, you need to play by the rules. Rules that were developed by who? China cannot play by the rules because you are the ones who set them. And then, who are those that have the measured decision powers in those houses? It is Europe. So where is Africa? Africa remains at the end of just receiving and paying high. Because even though we say that we say that debt is not a problem, but the way you give the debt to somebody matters. Absolutely. If I give you a debt, a, a loan, and you are supposed to pay, might be seven times or ten times more than another person, then there's a problem. You are not balanced. So the way this money is lend, loan, uh, loaned to Africans is different from the way it is loaned to Europeans. And so we need to also get to that point. We crack that down. Then we need to come back. The second aspect of it, we are looking at the leaders who go to take loans. When Africans want to go take loans, what are the projects that they have on the ground? When they go to China, China likes playing with loans that are on small, small projects. They don't like going with big projects. And when they come in, they, most of the thing with the Chinese people is that they don't want to put things written down because they have an intention which is not also a good intention. So at the end of the day, Africa keeps on suffering from both the Chinese, from the hands of both the Chinese and as well as the, the Europeans. We remain those two to, 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 to suffer. So that's why leaders, when they are going for this debt, the question is, what projects are they going? How, and how feasible are the projects? And secondly, what bargaining power do they go with when they want to take loans? Because you don't just go, maybe because you need a loan to solve a particular problem, you use the name of a project in a country, you take the debt, and that's why most of these loans are swindled. That's why when this money enters most nations in Africa, they disappear. Do you know by the end of 2020, Zambia as a country had only had gone into complete, had sunk. Absolutely, yeah. Zambia had sunk in debt. And the way to relieve them is, <laughs> I don't think uh, relieving uh, Zambia from debt is just by canceling their debt. Because when you cancel their debt, what will be the effect tomorrow? The funny thing is that the Chinese do not cancel debt. The Chinese do not offer debt reliefs. And that is where there is a problem. But are we supposed to be relieved from debt or we are supposed to be able to service our debt? And so we have a problem with the way African leaders run their countries. They run it as private properties which permit them to collect money and use the money which is meant for the development of the continent, the development of the country, for their private issues. Or even if it's not a private issue, the money that is placed on the table never goes for the project that the money went for. That is why you, there's a lot of corruption in Africa which needs to be dealt with. If we have to talk about being able to balance this issue, we need to deal with corruption in Africa. We need to deal with corrupt leaders. We need to get to a place where we pull this, 
we, we also balance uh, 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 the rules that permit a nation to take loans. Uh, 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 listening to you, King Dia, Professor Mark Anthony, it's true that there are some internal problems in Africa uh, which uh, actually uh, uh, make it uh, difficult for nations actually to service uh, their loans. Now, the, the issue is of uh, service their debt. Uh, you, listening to you, Kinley, I would love to, to ask uh, this question. Now we are in a world of uh, global transformation. It's true that we don't know the effect of, of uh, or, or how the effect of this transformation will look like, but then listening, and of course the raison d'etre uh, for the creation uh, of uh, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Do you think uh, that, and there, there has uh, been a recent call for uh, reforms in these financial institutions now, do you think uh, that it will bring more respite, especially to developing country, uh, countries uh, in the spheres or the, uh, in phase with uh, this uh, quest for a more uh, multipolar, uh, multipolar society that will actually maybe uh, uh, reduce uh, the uh, policies or the, the reforms uh, that exist, uh, which are not really favorable for developing nations in uh, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund? You see, <laughs> looking at things and looking going through the question you just asked, I want to say it is even the reforms will not really be beneficial to African countries. How? The reason is because okay, look at it. <laughs> if you want to see why the idea of reforms is coming, it's not necessarily because. Uh, Europe is listening to what Africa is saying. Europe is listening to China because China has imposed itself. And having imposed themselves, they have the, the BRICS bank that they have created, you know, it's found in Beijing, right? Sure. It's located in Beijing. Mm -hmm. Then the Asian Development Bank, which also gives loans, is in Beijing. And that is where China uh, gains its strength. And as a result of that, the IMF is seeing a problem. It is China is practically tilting attention away from the IMF to itself. So as a result of that, if they are supposed to do a reform within the World Bank and the IMF, it is going to be favoring China not Africa. And the intention for doing that, for asking, uh, for accepting even that there should be reforms, is because they have seen that China has decided to say, okay, what the IMF was doing, we can also do now by ourselves. Sure. By the, 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 BRICS is, the BRICS Bank is there to do what the IMF was doing, the World Bank was doing. And that will become a, a serious problem for the World Bank. Mm -hmm. And so why shouldn't they accept restructuring or reforms? reforms yeah. But to who are they accepting the reforms? Is it to the people who come take the loans? I mean, Africans who are the, 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 the people suffering from the yoke of these loans? Yeah. So I'm not against reforms. But I think Africans need to get to the place where they do what the government said. There should be cooperation within African nations. Absolutely, yeah. African nations, I think at a particular period of time, they got up and were talking of creating the African Development Bank, African Development Bank, which was supposed to be a bank that is majorly sponsored by African, by nation. African nations. But sure. if you look at it, the main sponsors of the bank are Europeans. And so it ends up not being an African bank, development bank. And so the question we should be asking is, where is Africa heading to if we have the wrong people sitting at the hands of the nation? What are they planning on how to restructure this, to balance this? Because it's not all about coming to make a speech. Making good speeches is nice. Sure. But we need to be able to take our speeches then put them on the ground, work on them. 
there is need for cooperation. There is need for Africans to come to, to unite, to build a united front, to face the world. Of recent, some of us, we laughed and laughed when the G20 actually, actually included African, African Union. Union as a member of the G20. African Union is not a country. African Union is made of 54 countries. And so if you see African leaders glad that they are happy that they have been included to be members of the G20, there's a problem. That is a problem. And so we need to get to the place where as leaders, we not only get excited over crumbs that are thrown on us, but we should become major decision makers on this. The future of Africa practically depends on solving the debt crisis problem that we are having right now. Absolutely. And if it is not done, we shouldn't be talking of development because we will remain a dead war, or put it the way, developing countries as they are calling us, when those who claim to be developed countries will keep on dictating the rules and implementing them and telling us what to do. And we will remain at the begging end. So I think we should not only look at these Westerners for doing what they are doing, because we are living in a war. I want to tell you this. I'll, I'll Survivor of the fetus is there. Absolutely. And so Africans must be able to stand, to be able to face the bull by its horns, not waiting that they should be given crumbs. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Professor Mark Anthony. Uh, coming back to you, uh, Cheniola Tayo, uh, we are looking at, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the factors uh, that are affecting Africa and, of course, bringing down the country or countries uh, to, f to the position of uh, being uh, uh, in debt, uh, distress or debt crisis. So the question is, uh, in your uh, perspective as an uh, uh, maybe economic uh, expert or investment expert, what do you think uh, are the right parameters for African countries to use to be able uh, to have a say in uh, the financial markets that will uh, maybe uh, go a long way to helping countries also solve uh, the debt uh, burden faced by developing nations? Um, thank you for the question. So it's true that um, when it comes to giving loans to African countries, sometimes the terms are not favorable, or even when you compare them to some of the terms that are given to Latin American countries that have similar economic profiles. So that is very true. So there's been a push you know, against the discrimination that seems to be happening um, at that level. Uh, and it's also linked to the ratings agencies. So you have ratings agencies um, really downgrading um, um, African countries in terms of their debt stock. And then that affects um, the interest rates that they're able to access at the, at the international markets or the financial markets. So yes, there is some diplomacy that is involved here. It's one of the things that Kagame as a person is trying to do. Um, I, I hope my internet is still stable and I hope you can hear me. But um, I think beyond that, uh, again, like um, the fellow guest was saying, you know, even when we access these loans, there's the question of what we spend the loans on. But the issue here is that um, we're talking about reform or IMF reform. The issue here is that one of the main issues we've had in African development historically was um, in the post-independence period, because a lot of African countries, you know, with the leaders very excited, finally being in charge of their economies. And then they started to try to invest in, in the economy in terms of trying to drive industrialization. But this was very expensive. So they found themselves in debt, you know, very deep debt. And now when the, the Bretton Woods institution stepped in to try to rescue that process, um, they came with terms. So they said, okay, fine, we're going to take care of these debts for you and make it easier. But they came with terms, and that's referred to as the structural adjustment program, because it was at that point that they discouraged the investments in some public services by some African governments, because they felt that um, those were too expensive. In fact, some people say that um, that whole you know, a period um, contributed to the fact that up till today, very few of African countries are industrialized. So we need to be careful even when we talk about um, global responsibility or balancing responsibility because African countries are sovereign nations. So there's a limit to, to what um, 
uh, lenders, you know, there's a limit to what extent lenders are supposed to tell them what to use um, the, the loans for. Um, yeah, because it's, it's uh, historically that's not been the best way to go about things. At the end of the day, it's the Africans that know more, more about the economies and these external actors. But then at the same time, you're very right that these terms have to be more favorable in order for them to be sustainable, uh, as one example. But also that it will be good if even as these discussions um, about the loans are being had, that there is more of a collaborative effort towards it. So a more realistic um, estimation of, you know, when it will be possible to start to pay back these loans and what needs to happen, you know, even before that can, that can begin. So I agree with a lot of the points that have been raised, uh, that have been raised previously. And for the, your question directly, I think that it's about diplomacy. It's also about standing our ground because it is a fact that the terms that we are exposed to many times are less favorable even compared to countries with similar profiles. The, uh, uh, so, uh, according to you, do you think uh, this uh, credit nations should provide uh, uh, greater transparency in uh, lending pra uh, practices and also uh, ensure responsible borrowing uh, by developing nations? So there is um, something that is said very often, uh, particularly by one of my academic mentors, Kandewiri. Uh, he's late now. It's been a break between the African intelligentsia and then the African government. Can you still hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's been a break between the African intelligentsia and the African leaders ideally what we want is not even for these economic try to take on the responsibility for teaching us borrowing because it's not and it's supposed to be the job of the african intelligence here so african economic experts um that can advise governments on the best way to go about these debts on the best ways to go about spending on the most effective or efficient product uh, project um that these loans ought to be spent on we have, as, as another example, in Nigeria, we have um, a metro line in Abuja here. A lot of money was spent on that, that metro, but it's in zero to the economy at the moment because it's not even in use, really viable. So it's the African intelligentsia that ought to be filling these gaps in the knowledge um, in terms of borrowing and spending um, for African governments. Professor Mark Anthony, of course, uh, let's take it from a political perspective. And of course, we're looking at uh, faced with uh, the debt crisis. Do you think or how can uh, debt uh, transparency and accountability uh, be improved to prevent corruption? You've made mentioned about the fact that corruption is eating and has eaten deep into uh, the economies of uh, developing nations or especially in Africa. So do you think or how can can debt transparency and accountability be improved to prevent this corruption and embezzlement of funds in developing nations? Okay, thank you very much again, Gl Clarice. Uh, before getting to respond to that question, I want to say that there is no nation that actually develops because of debt. Debt don't develop a country. It is true we are living in a global world. And maybe we have projects we want to execute. But I think also that there is need for African nations as a group of collective nations to be able to get to a place where they define what development is to them, which I think is different from what Europeans consider to be development. We do not have the same challenges we do not have the same situation europeans have different projects they should be handling which it has nothing to do with us you see there is a project which i listened to gagami actually projecting there about uh, the uh, that is uh, talking about, it's, it's related to environmental protection or whatsoever africa does not need environmental protection because africans protect environment necessarily not by uh, it is part of our culture those who destroy the environment in Africa are those who come, they need wood. They get cutting down everything that they see in the, in the, there. 
the, 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 the ones to exploit gold, they dig everywhere. It is not the job of Africans. Those who are doing that destruction are not Africans. And so we need to get to a place where we know what our projects are and which ones to sponsor, what developmental project we want to handle, then we engage in. And also coming back now to the question you asked, if we want to talk about reducing corruption within uh, the continent as well as particular countries in Africa, we must be able to put down some rules and regulations which permit uh, 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 corrupt individuals to be punished. You see, in other countries around the world, corruption is punished with, uh, with capital penalty. It's a, <laughs> when I talk of capital penalty, it's dead. And as long as individuals know that capital punishment will be used as a way to soft, to, to, to punish an individual who is corrupt, it will restrict corruption. When J.J. Rollins actually took over uh, uh, Ghana in the 80s, what he did was he was very, very rugged. Let me use that word. He executed corrupt persons. I mean, when I say executed, he gave them capital punishment in the public. It frightens a lot of persons who are coming into leadership. And as a result of that, he gradually built and transformed Ghana from the very poor nation it used to be in the 80s to a developing and fast developing African country. Of recent, corruption has entered back in Ghana. That's why Ghana is one of those countries that need debt relief, as we are talking, because in 2022, it sank. <laughs> why? Because of corruption. We are talking about Africa getting to a place where it can choose to develop by being able to fix in-house. We must fix things in-house. You see, we, we might blame or you can take loans at very high rates and still use them effectively and still be able to service those loans later. <laughs> you are dead. But look at it. When you have individuals who think of themselves, corrupt, no accountability. For example, we want to use Cameroon as a nation where the constitution, which is supposed to be the highest law of the nation, in, I think, uh, somewhere, actually demands that if you are to take office as an elected official, you have to declare your assets. But nobody, from the head of the nation down to the mayors, nobody declares elections. And that has de declares the assets, I beg your pardon. And that has been normal. And they are sitting in power. Where do you think the money that is meant for the development of their communities go to? They swindle it. Embezzlement takes place. There is no accountability that is presented. But if death penalty was placed on the ground, a lot of persons will run away. I want to use Cameroon in the, in the 80s, 70s and 80s. Aijo was given, also, he used to punish corruption with capital punishment. Corruption was rare. And that is why, before he left power, he left power, Cameroon was a debt-free nation. Within five years of the leadership of the present leader, Cameroon sank. The talk of devaluation. And Cameroon entered into a state where we needed help. What happened? The IMF came imposing stop production, home production, that today we are struggling to bring back. Agriculture, which was supposed to be the basic industry of the country, was cut off so that we could import. There's a spend, spend more money. We borrow more money and spend in, in empowering, empowering European companies. 
You need to import issues. That is very problematic. And so that's why, you see, when we talk about IMF, I always say that IMF, World Bank, those are banks or financial institutions that were created to service European tribes, not the world. And anything about out of it, naturally, they will need to ask you for more interest because that is was not meant, they were not created for you people. And that's why it's diplomacy. And that, the diplomacy, okay, look at it. Today we are talking about struggling to renegotiate issues. The West wants to negotiate without bringing in China, which is a major player in Africa. Sure. There is no possibility for them to take decisions which will affect Africans without bringing in the Chinese and without working along with the Africans. And so there is need for serious diplomacy to solve that. But as you talked about, the political situation in Africa is what needs to be restructured the most. We need leadership that works for the good of the people. We need leadership that thinks of the development of the continent, not leadership that thinks of self-development. People will think of themselves. Most of those who come into power are actually coming into power not because they want to serve the nation, but simply because they think it is a means to are enrich you, themselves. Uh, sorry to, to cut you short. Are you in other words saying uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the type of politics uh, uh, actually practiced by African uh, politicians is uh, the reason why some of these countries find themselves in a uh, debt crisis? If yes, so, so what is the way forward? I, 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 I should be talking about the kind of policies, not even the politics, because when we look at the politics that is in Africa, Africa does not really have a, a political system that they, 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 they are implementing. They, 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 after post-independence, post as we, are we call it, mm -hmm. they, were impl they were forced to implement borrowed political okay. strategy yes. systems which were not theirs. And that has remained for over 60 years. Mm -hmm. And so you do not expect any change to come from you being told to do. You don't say you are independent and you are told what to do. And that plays majorly on it. We must get to a place where we become independent, meaning that you must get, first of all, you see, before you cooperate with somebody, you must be separate. Africa had never been separated from the colonial powers and so as long as they are not separated from the colonial powers you can't claim that they have anything that they are running and that is why in africa europe african leaders still go to report to european leaders if you would like to know 14 french speaking nations in africa go deposit reports to the french if they need to have support from french I think perspectives are changing and, and the, the That is the reason why you see an uprising that is taking place where sure, African sure. nations, uh, recently Niger, mm -hmm. send them out. Mali had done so, Burkina Faso had done so. It is because of such. Sure. Look at what happened. That played majorly where the, 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 the French, the French club mm -hmm. is majorly the financial decision power for Africa. So, how do you expect them? And now they are struggling to get into the, the, the other English speaking and other the, 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 the nations in Africa. So, we need to get to a place where we, 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 we define our own policies Absolutely. that govern us, our developmental policies. Because, and be because, intentional about implementing the policies. Yes, because I'll be sincere Africans do not have developmental process, uh, policies that they solely sit down and define for themselves. They are imposed developmental policies. They are told what to develop. And <laughs> if you are told what to develop, you do not expect to do what you want. So we must leave that bench where we are imposed on decisions to start this making decisions. Uh, okay, yeah, it's very imperative uh, that uh, uh, the leadership of Africa uh, that equally understands uh, the terrain, sees what is practical, uh, like I always see in democracy, is what works for the people and not what is, uh, the people are being told to do. And of course, uh, the reason is to see uh, 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 
uh, being here today, of course, is to see how Africa uh, and other developing nations across the globe can uh, solve uh, the debt crisis. Uh, Chaniola, coming uh, to you again, uh, uh, we are looking at a lo long-term uh, uh, solutions for uh, the debt uh, uh, resolution. So in your perspective, what uh, maybe uh, are the available uh, innovative solutions that governments or nations can explore uh, to resolve the debt crisis in the developing countries? Thank you very much. And my apologies if there's some noise from my from my background. But then the solutions, you know, uh, relates to some of the things we've already discussed. Like we said, debt is neither good nor bad. It's about how you spend it, what you spend it on, and to what extent um, it will become useful in the in the future. So one of the solutions that I see, like I said, is for African for the knowledge around you know debt expenditure, the knowledge around spending to become firmer for African governments. This looks different for different African economies in general. So what should Nigeria as a country be spending on um today that will mean that we're in a better revenue position tomorrow? What should Burkina Faso be spending on today that will mean that they're in a better revenue position tomorrow? South Africa, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Ghana you know, Togo. So, you know, we need to do that work of figuring out the best things to be spending on. Infrastructure is good, but not all infrastructure is equal. You know, you can spend uh, millions of dollars on infrastructure, but then it lies fallow and it doesn't even contribute anything to your economy. So we need to be doing that better. Then, of course, we've said that we need to negotiate better terms when it comes to these loans that we take on board. So, and this calls for continental diplomacy. So it's not one country trying to do that on their own, but, um, you know, the African Union really leading that, leading that charge. I know they've been making some efforts towards doing that because when we speak with one voice as the African Union, now we are part of the G20. So this should be part of the agenda for the G20, you know, negotiating better terms um, for the loans that we take um, from either multilateral lenders or from bilateral lenders. So that's the second solution. Mm -hmm. And I'd say the third solution is just really to figure out how to improve our revenue profile, even as countries, right? Like we said, debt is neither bad nor good and all countries or most countries run on, on, on debt. But it's very important to know how to grow your own revenue as a country also um, as, an African, as an African country um, within the continent. So what are the things that we can do now to grow our revenues? I think some of us need to be collecting more taxes but it's not even just about collecting more taxes from our people, it's about increasing economic activity. Because if people are making more money, then automatically the government will be making more money. So not just trying to take the small money that they have, but then doing things, making investments, that means that there is more wealth for everyone, and then by extension for the government as well. So I'd say these are three pillars of solutions um, for the future when it comes to debt sustainability um, and global cooperation for African countries. So highlighting uh, the internal uh, uh, methods so or possible solutions that, that can be adopted internally to see how developing nations can solve uh, the debt crisis. Uh, staying with you still, uh, Tenela, let's look at now the, the role of global cooperation because when we are talking about the debt crisis faced by developing countries, uh, especially in Africa, uh, it also has to do with uh, the, uh, the global world and now, what uh, are the, uh, maybe what they ca can they uh, uh, explore effectively uh, in uh, trying to solve this globally? Uh, maybe uh, the effectiveness of uh, debt uh, restructuring and relief programs, or even uh, debt forgiveness and uh, alternative financial uh, mechanisms. Do you think uh, at, at the global level, uh, this can go a long way uh, to, to bring in practical solutions? Uh, to the debt burden faced by nations in Africa. The agenda that Africa or African countries need to be push, pushing at the global level. So I mentioned that already um, the AU, the African Union, has been added to the G20. So debt diplomacy could be top of the agenda also for the interactions that they have with other G20 members. Then of course, we've been talking about increasing South-South cooperation. So you have um, some African countries that have been invited to join the BRICS and the implications of that. Because when you talk about alternative financing um, sources, uh, the idea is that instead of everyone going to Western on um, bilateral lenders, you can also explore Southern bilateral lenders or global Southern, in quotes, bilateral lenders that may give you better terms. And then even, 
you know, what format is this lending taking? So there's been a lot of talk about China and what China does. China does like a project based, usually project based approach to giving to giving loans. But even that is not good enough because some of these projects like has been mentioned already are not very viable or they're not very economically even attractive in terms of trying to improve um, revenue. So you're very right that yes, um, when it comes to global cooperation, there's lots to be done. Uh, a lot has been has been happening, I will say. I know that this has been on the agenda even for the UN, for the Bretton Woods institutions. There's been lots of discussions about it. But I think that um, the African voice hasn't really come together as one um, so far. During the pandemic, you know, there was a, I think there was a special envoy on debt. You know, I think even um, Dr. Ngozi Okonjewela was 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 part of that um, at the time. And when they were trying to negotiate debt forgiveness for African countries, I don't think they got a lot of debt forgiveness. But then um, there was some like uh, moratoriums or, or pausing in the in the debt servicing. So that pragmatic approach, where instead of just um, wishing that um, some countries that are currently in distress will find their way out of it. Um, we need to be very clear eyed in assessing that, okay, this is not sustainable. What do you need to do next? Um, it's, it's a position that we find ourselves in in Nigeria at the moment, you know, just admitting that, that um, the current situation is not sustainable. So we need to do something about it instead of waiting till the last moment when we can no longer service our loans. Uh, Taniola, uh, I will uh, round off with you, uh, Professor Mark Anthony. Of course, uh, the issue here, uh, looking at it from a global level, we see uh, that Africa's voice uh, is still uh, very timid when it comes to global affairs, and we equally highlight it uh, that Africa is not fully engaged in the financial markets or cannot uh, fully implement policies that can even uh, favor the continent in terms of uh, uh, borrowing or maybe uh, uh, taking loans from uh, the uh, the World Bank, uh, the International Monetary Fund, and even private creditors. So uh, what can we say is, uh, holistically, uh, can, can we say African nations can do at this particular moment because we already know uh, the, the problem. So what is the way forward? How can Africa position itself in uh, these uh, global financial uh, markets or financial situations that will help the country uh, to maybe uh, uh, solve uh, the, the, the debt crisis and other related uh, crises which are actually hampering the socioeconomic development of nations. Thank you again, uh, Clarice. I don't think we really know the problem of Africa, but I want to give the problem if I give the answer. Absolutely. You see, a lot of us actually focus on the fruit and not on the root of the problem of Africa. Africa as a country, as a, a, let me use the word as a country or as a nation, was played with far back when the Europeans discovered the import, importance of Africa, they came here looting it and looting it to go build their country. In 1884, they decided to break this nation into minor states, which they call countries, by creating artificial boundaries. This became the major problem of Africa. And they created a situation and a policy that kept Africans divided. As a result, of these, they were able to keep looting Africa for their own development against the development of Africa. Where, when they wanted to shift from slavery, they came in with colonialism. When they wanted to shift from colonialism, they came in with their so-called independence, which they were bringing in neo-colonialism. Sure. And as a result of that, Africa has been a farm for Europe. That is why Africa has no voice. Because as a divided people, there is no possibility for you to raise your voice. And so if Africa will get to that place where it can take independent decisions, economic decisions, then we must go back to visit the thoughts of Kwame Nkrumah in 1963, where he asked the African leaders, now that we have struggled to say we are getting independence, we should immediately get into economic independence. You can't use political independence without economic independence and become 
an independent nation. Absolutely. And so it is very important. We go back to the 1963, revisit the thoughts. We work on it. I don't. That is why I kept on saying that leadership in Africa is one of the greatest problems, and that is the reason why we are where we are with a division that we have. It is practically difficult for us to to stand as a voice and talk, and the world listens to us. The so-called Euro African Union that has been brought into what, what they call the G20 has no power. Why? Because the chairman of the African Union Commission is not the president of any nation. He has no power except what he is given. And as a result of that, he cannot take any decision for, for Africans. And so we need an African nation to be reconstituted. What we might call united whatsoever, but we need a confederation of nations in Africa so that we can have a single power. With Africa standing as a single power, a single economic power, we will have a very major position to stand with. We will have a voice because our economy will be standing at over three point something billion US dollars. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, the African voice will have, will have a currency which will permit us to be able to trade and take decisions in the world market. Without this economic decision power taking, we do not have anything that will say. Let us sit and ask for all the debt reliefs that we want to ask. Let them even relieve all our debts and say we, you are free. We will sink back into another debt. Why? Because they are running the game. They are telling us what we need to do. They determine the projects we need to run. Why? We are, di we are divided. We are divided. And so there is need for a united Africa. When we talk of united Africa, it should not be a united Africa for political reasons only. We are talking from, from an economic perspective. Yeah, absolutely. From an economic perspective. An Africa that has its own currency. That is not dependent on European, on Euro, neither on dollar. The dollar. We have a currency that we can place on the table and tell them we work based on this. And trade with Europe, trade with China will be determined by our own currency. When the Chinese come here, they don't do business with dollar. They do it with yen. When you want to do dollar uh, trade with, with America, they come with the, with the dollar. dollar. How many currencies do we have in Africa? We have, you come here, you have kwasha, you have new kwasha, you have, you go to Nigeria, you have Naira, you go to Ghana, you have CDs, you come to Cameroon, France, CFA, you go to, so, so with all the so-called currencies which are practically nothing you cannot imagine we have all the gold in the world but a unit of european currency just a unit is about three thousand units of us so how can it be possible that we can do trade that we can talk economic independence if we do not bring all this economy together with the 1.3 billion population that becomes a major market then we can now talk but without this everything will be seen as proposals for solutions to the debt relief and whatsoever will still bring us into another debt so africa needs a united front to indeed. face the world in detail professor mark anthony africa a united front uh, in every uh, sphere to be able to, to face the world, which I will reiterate, the world that is going through uh, global transformation and, of course, uh, living from a unipolar to a multipolar system. But then the African continent can only uh, has a vo or have a voice, I beg your pardon, in uh, these uh, transformation if uh, they are intentional or the leadership or other stakeholders across the Africa. And I think uh, from all all of that uh, uh, the uh, panel of experts have underlined uh, regarding uh, this topic for discussion today, which is looking at how uh, the African or developing nations can actually uh, uh, get out of the debt crisis. It is imperative, like Teniola uh, underlined, for Africa to opt its own uh, uh, diplomacy and, of course, uh, uh, for Africa also to have a voice at the global level. Uh, and 
and also have policies, economic policies that will be favorable to the uh, uh, total transformation, socioeconomic transformation of the continent. I want to thank you all uh, for actually uh, participating in uh, this uh, program. Uh, we are going uh, to end the program, but before we do that, I want to I want to appreciate uh, uh, Tenel Tayo who joined us from Nigeria and uh, investment trade and investment uh, expert. Thank you for your insight and of course uh, Professor Mark Anthony. Uh, thank you for your insights too on uh, this uh, very important uh, uh, topic, uh, which uh, of course uh, uh, focuses on the problems faced by the African continent. I think it's also a call for all the stakeholders in, uh, across Africa, especially economic stakeholders, to make their voices heard on topical issues uh, that affect the African continent. And by so doing, uh, we are going to go a long way to solving uh, the problems of Africa and make Africa great. We have the population, we have the markets, and we have the resources. So there is need for Africa to be developed. Let's actually explore those available resources, those available avenues for the good of the African people. Thank you, and do have a great time on Afric Media Television. Keep watching. Afric Media. Le monde, c'est nous.